Hey everyone, back again. Now, second part to dissemination here, talking about the second chapter or the first chapter after that preface, non-preface, chapter one, whatever. Now we're going to get into Plato's Pharmacy, probably the chapter most people are interested in. But before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. If you're new here, welcome. Hi, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe. You can go check out however many videos I have up now, like 250 or something, which is a wild number. Uh, and I release videos once, maybe twice a week. So subscribe and you'll, you know, subscribe. Sounded like Christopher Walken. Uh, and you can see that however often they come up. If you want to help me out, you can like, share, subscribe, do all those things. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal. And yeah, don't waste any more of your time with that stuff. Let's jump into Plato's Pharmacy, the second chapter of Dissemination. Now, this chapter starts with kind of a preface. It's not called a preface. It's just something that comes before the rest of the text. But it's a part of it. Remember, from the last episode, it doesn't exist outside unless everything is outside and so on. But this preface, if I would call it that, is meditates on reading and writing and the nature of reading and writing. So a text is that which exists by rules unknowable to a reader. So when you read something, you know, we don't, we aren't always cognizant of the various tacit rules that underwrite a text. For example, and this is a silly example, let's say um, I saw a cat that happened to be rich, <laughs> a black rich cat. And it, if I were to describe the cat, I would say the skinny, rich, black cat. And the order in which I describe those adjectives or use those adjectives is kind of important. Because if I said the black, rich, skinny cat, that doesn't seem right, which might be a silly example. Anyways, my point is that within language are rules that we don't always know. And these get compounded with writing as well and with reading. That is, when we read something, we aren't always aware of all of these codes, of all these rules. But these rules are also unknowable to the writer. So it's not just the reader who's unaware of what's going on. The writer is also not going to be fully aware of what's going on because they just adopt language without necessarily learning it. I mean, when we're kids, we just learn language. We don't necessarily learn the rules of language. Maybe if you tried to learn a second language, you would actually sit down with the rules and learn how to you know, properly conjugate verbs and proper syntax and so on. Otherwise, we just kind of know it. Uh, and when we write, we just tacitly communicate that knowing, that knowledge, without our being aware of it, which is, I think it's true. Doesn't seem wrong to me. Now, the real tricky part here is his claim that reading and writing are very much similar operations. You know, there isn't a writer without a reader. There isn't a reader without a writer. And when you read something, you aren't just uh, standing as a neutral observer to a text when you read something, those words are being inputted onto your mind. You know, you look at words and those words have to go through your eyeballs. Or if you happen to, uh, if you are sightless, you know, th through your fingers, however you are reading, it goes into your brain, which you then understand in that way. So as a reader, you were kind of writing words onto your body, <laughs> into your brain, onto your soul, maybe, who knows? And that is demonstrates the extent to which there is a, a, or Derrida is playing with the distinction between reading and writing or the position of, you know, the reader or the writer. And to possibly understand these tacit rules that underwrite writing, that underwrite any kind of textuality depends upon our diving into textuality, diving into this logic of writing, which is often, an, is often illogical. That is, insofar as logic is that privileged uh, idea that it would then be associated with the speech or the divine word of God, whatever. It demands us to jump into that, which doesn't necessarily promise that any fruitful conclusions will come from it. In fact, maybe the only thing that will be revealed, which can then after the fact be identified in its value, is the fact that even the person who tries to jump in to grapple with these hidden rules, these hidden terms, them, them, they themselves only come to terms with their own or only learn about their own textuality, their own exteriority. And this is what Derrida kind of does with 
Plato's Phaedrus. So here we get, finally after this kind of preface thing, into the Phaedrus. Now, the Phaedrus, out of Plato, is a dialogue between Socrates and Phaedrus, where they discuss love, among other things. And to put it really, this is the story in like 30 seconds. Socrates and Phaedrus go and leave the city and go stand like under a tree near, I think, like a little river, whatever. And Phaedrus, under his cloak, starts reciting to Socrates the words of Lysias out of a, one of his uh, writings that explains love. And to many people, and then, sorry, and then Socrates follows up with this with a story about how writing, using Egyptian mythology, how writing is, uh, will actually be, will mark the demise of memory and of knowledge because people will rely, as Phaedrus does here, relying on this text, he loses the capacity to use his own mind, to use his own faculties of cognition. Now, commentators before Derrida have said pretty much, you know, all <laughs> in harmony with one another or in unison, have said that this text is kind of juvenile and silly. All it is is Plato condemning writing. Plato's just saying that writing sucks. It doesn't actually lead to truth. And they're quick to point out the irony that Plato wrote. So what does that say about his writing? Now, Derrida is a little bit more uh, nuanced and a little bit more clever in that he says that Plato is really defending writing in this text. And it's a kind of a mysterious claim to make. But as we will go through this, and this is the point I think you really need to be uh, attuned to as we go through this, Plato is, to some extent, defending writing here not criticizing it in the way that some people have come to believe it. And some of the ways that people have been kind of uh, made to believe that Plato is criticizing writing is with the translation of the term pharmacon, which can translate into either poison or cure. And I don't know if anyone, if any skincare people are out there, uh, you've probably come across the videos of James Welsh, who's a skincare YouTuber out of He's in London, somewhere in the UK. Uh, and he has this funny line when he's talking about skincare products where he'll say that uh, it's the it's it's the dose that makes the poison. So talking about skincare products, some of them can be really bad if you use too much of it, but they can be quite good if you don't use too much of it. So in this case, I'm using this example to highlight that a remedy can be a poison if it is used incorrectly. Tylenol can be a poison if it is used too too much. Uh, you know, same with like alcohol, whatever. It can have good effects or bad effects. So, and I'm, really this is all like kind of preface to how uh, Derrida is going to approach this here, but I think it's important to lay this out first so you have an idea of what's going on. Plato uses this term pharmacon to describe writing. Now, translators, depending on the context, have either translated that to being either a remedy or a poison a cure or a poison. And this has obviously influenced readers being like, oh, Plato hates uh, writing. Whereas Derrida shows, no, 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 this term is a lot more ambiguous. And when Plato uses it, he's being a lot more ambiguous. Instead, Plato is really highlighting the intractability or the uncertainty or the impossibility of calling writing either a remedy or a poison. And the point that Derrida will take from that is that writing exists in both worlds. It is something that embodies both uh, knowledge in this sense here and unknowledge, or uh, truth and non-truth, presence and non-presence. It embodies all of these characteristics at once, remedy and poison, cure and poison. So as I go on here, I'm gonna be repeating some of that, but that was, I just want you to know that as we go forward. So in the Phaedrus, Phaedrus actually says that, or equates writing with uh, sophistry and with like speech writing, you know, as being just like political tools, you, you know, not actually uh, moving towards truth. And Socrates' response, and Derrida takes this as evidence that Plato was much more ambiguous about uh, his approach to writing or his understanding of writing, belief about it. Socrates says that he actually leaves room that there can be the possibility of very beautiful writing that opens up 
certain possibilities towards knowledge that can actually motivate that while there is bad writing. So it can be either good or bad, not just bad wholesale. Now, the, the scene, um, the location of this dialogue is interesting because, as I mentioned, Phaedrus and Socrates leave the city, which Socrates rarely did. Uh, he, you know, he spent time in the military, I believe, and did other little trips, but he very rarely left the city. And Derrida says that the written word almost seduced Socrates out, like Lysias's, or sorry, Phaedrus's promise, you know, in reading Lysias, got Socrates out of the city. It actually housed this kind of uh, magical quality. It almost intoxicated Socrates. And of course, he, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. And it is all the more interesting because Socrates believed that the city was where truth could be attained, not in nature. You can't come to truth uh, with a tree. You have to do it with another human being, which is the kind of dialectical uh, strand in Plato. Dialectical, at least in how Derrida is understanding it here, dialectical being the meeting of two different opinions that can reconcile into a higher uh, form of truth, a higher understanding. So the written word was able to take Socrates outside of that domain of truth, the city, among other people. Now, at the end of Phaedrus' speech, where he's, you know, just reading Lysias under his coat, Socrates responds with his own story, which is pretty much, uh, it's pretty ironic, because he criticizes Phaedrus for just reciting a story, for just reciting someone else's words. And he does that by responding with his own story. And that story goes like this. This is the Egyptian myth of Tamus and Tote, or the sun god and the moon god. Uh, you know, the Amun-Ra and the, whatever the moon is. <laughs> Tamus and Tote in the Egyptian uh, mythological tradition. So one day in the kingdom, Tote, the moon god, or the demigod uh, of numbers, of geometry, and of writing, goes up to Tamus, the king of Egypt, and the, the sun god, and he goes up to Tamus and he says, man, you know what? I got a way that people are going to just make their lives so much easier. They're going to make their lives so much easier. It's this thing called writing. And what it will do is it will emancipate people. It will liberate people from the necessity of having to remember silly little details. And with that, they will then be able to do new and better things. Where if they can write something down, they don't have to think about it. They can think of something else. They can leave room in their minds for something else. And Tote says, the moon, the moon demigod, says that it will be a recipe. It will be a recipe for both memory and wisdom. But Tamus, the sun god, is not convinced. Tamus responds apprehensively, a little suspiciously, kind of paternalistically, almost as though secretly he's afraid that the written word might usurp his spoken word and the authority of his spoken word and it's it, it's also funny writing is often associated with a kind of femininity in in all these traditions it's associated with uh just rote memorization or just like uh putting things down without actually lending oneself over to the ideas almost making life easy which has often been associated with uh, femininity in these traditions where by contrast you have logos being living knowledge the word of god is much closer to uh is it much closer to god whereas writing being only a simulacrum of uh, being only a copy essentially of that living speech is kind of dead it is closer to uh, sin then and of course tamus the sun god doesn't buy it he says instead, what writing will do, will, will it will make people's memories weaker because they won't need to rely on them anymore. It will make them incapable of critical thought. Now, Derrida stresses the association of speech with logos, with rationality, with truth, uh, with very much like father figures in order to really demonstrate, you know, this binary opposition that's found at the core of, uh, of this disdain for writing. And we can very much hear the same thing in Nietzsche. For anyone, to, for anyone who's read The uh, Birth of Tragedy, which I've covered on here, which you can go check out if you want, um, The Birth of Tragedy involves pretty much Nietzsche criticizing 
the emphasis on Apollonian discourse or Apollonian art at the expense of Dionysian art. Apollonian art and Socrates being one of the seminal figures here, Apollonian art being associated with rationality, truth, and all that. Dionysian art being associated with uh, the body, sin, things that aren't as savory, and so on. So associating speech, I guess, with uh, Thamus, with the sun god, kind of makes sense. Because Thamus, being the sun god, is the one that gives life. And speech is associated with living knowledge, not dead knowledge. Whereas the moon is, you know, uh, it, it brings up zombies. It's not actually, uh, brings up werewolves. It brings up demons. It's not actually going to bring uh, full-fledged life. And on that note, how about an ad? All right. Hope that wasn't too jarring. Uh, here now, Derrida returns once more to that myth. That is the myth between Tamus and Tote between the sun god and the moon god, it makes an interesting observation where he says that between the moon and the sun is not that much difference. Where at night, the moon kind of assumes the place of the sun and Tote replaces Tamus by supplementing him and supplanting him, like taking over his position when he's, when he's not there. And the moon lights up the night sky. You know, for anyone who's been outside uh, at night, you know that the moon is a source of light. And despite Tamus's belief that writing is a kind of dead knowledge and associates that with darkness, with Tote, with the moon, and so on, Derrida is clear that Tote does not merely write down the weight of dead souls, like keeping track of the dead. He actually first counts out the days of life. And Tote assumes the role of a kind of trickstery-ish figure in this dynamic. He's kind of like a Loki, uh, he or Dionysus. He, he kind of bounces around and does does things that don't fit in with a certain uh, hegemonic status quo. So Tamus, by contrast, Tamus being the origin, that is the sun, being the sun god, acts as a kind of transcendental signified to all signification, where it all leads back to this origin, the sun, the sun god. Whereas uh, Tote, the moon god, moon demigod, is associated with a kind of uh, indiscernibility. He is much more slippery. He doesn't lend himself to signification so neatly. Or in Derrida's words, he is a sort of joker, a floating signifier, a wild card, one who puts play into play. So despite being the god of numbers and the god of writing, two expressions that are apparently solid, two modes of, of expression that are apparently dead because they aren't living speech, Tote is never stagnant. Tote is all very much alive, bouncing around, uh, you know, doing all kinds of wild things. And he is necessary for Tamus's position as this original unitary thing, uh, very much stagnant, standing in for rationality and truth. That could only be possible with a necessary antithesis that is constructed to be opposite to it, when in fact they share very many of the same uh, elements. They resemble one another, like how the moon supplies light, like the sun, and so on. And additionally, Tote had great knowledge of medicine. Not only could he take away life, he could very much give it as well. So when Tote offers writing to Tamus, to the sun god, he does so as a remedy. One possible uh, understanding of the term pharmacon, it, it was meant to remedy people of the trouble of uh, having to remember useless things so that they could open themselves up to more interesting things. However, there's an issue here with translation that I mentioned earlier, because Sometimes pharmacon could just be translated to poison, or it could be translated to remedy, depending on uh, who uses it. When Tote uses it, it could be understood as a poison. But when Tamus uses it, or sorry, when Tote uses it, the moon god, it could be understood as a uh, remedy. But when Tamus responds, it is constructed as a poison. Now, in the original, the term pharmacon, it, of course, is then much more ambiguous when each of them use it when Tote uses it and when Tamus uses it, because they're both describing an ambiguous thing, the pharmacon, that can be either good or bad. Very much the same like in English today with the term drug. You know, a drug can be good or bad. Drug, uh, like if a few thousand years from now, if someone was to translate random texts or from, uh, from today, they might have a hard time with the term called drug because it is used like on the news as a bad thing. You know, drugs are 
uh, the drug crisis or, or whatever. But then in the case of like for the pharmaceutical industry, it's used as a good thing. Drugs are what is going to keep people alive or cure people. And so this problem could also present itself in the future. And the point is that the term oscillates between these two possible meanings. Now, in how Tamis does approach writing, of course, let's, let's be clear, Tamis doesn't celebrate it or else he would have welcomed it. He, or it is framed not necessarily as being like evil, so to speak. It is associated with a kind of uh, lesserness of, of human cognition where uh, people are viewed as being fake or self-proclaimed as being wise, you know, a kind of a fake wiseness or fake wisdom wiseness. And these are people who have, in the eyes of Tamis, the sun god, they've been duped. They have submitted to the idea of substitution, that is the substitution of real living memory in favor of uh, a simulation of memory. They essentially given into the mnemonic device for live memory, that is writing. But think of it this way. If speech is that which stands in for living, is the living real thing, and it is primary, and it is superior in every single way. What is really the threat that writing can pose to it? If writing does pose a threat to it, maybe, just maybe, that reveals the extent to which speech is itself only a kind of a writing. Speech is itself only the meeting of language in the terms of signs, the spoken words, with someone else who is interpreting them very much like they would interpret words on a page. And so perhaps this reveals how logos, how philosophy, how dialectics, how memory are themselves only representations of the truth. And here we get Derrida saying that Plato imitates the imitators in order to restore the truth of what they imitate, namely truth itself. And don't we see this at play with Socrates himself, who's a kind of sophistical figure? He's kind of a sophist. Like, think of this this dialogue. Socrates is just reciting a story in order to make a greater point. He's using writing, essentially. He's using uh, not his, not like um, his knowledge. He's just essentially reciting something else that's already been said in order to make his point. That is, there's he's using a dead idea, a dead language that isn't wasn't didn't sprout out from that conversation as a true living thing but rather is something that came from before and has now, through transportation, uh, lost its living nature, uses that to arrive at a truth. So Plato is here, is playing on the very nature of writing, using writing against writing. He's imitating the imitators, as uh, Derrida says. And there are other dialogues where Socrates is accused of being a kind of uh, trickster joker figure, where he puts people under his hit kind of hypnotic spell. So there are moments when, and I think it's Mino criticizes Socrates for this because Socrates is using his words and not allowing people to actually respond or to leave room for a response. He is actually killing speech. He's actually killing this dialectic and he becomes only like a text that a text being that thing within this cultural imagination, that thing that does not allow a response. Because you can't respond to a text, you can respond to a human. And very much so, the way that Socrates apparently criticizes that about writing, he does that himself. He does not permit a response in, in many different uh, other dialogues. And, you know, we see that in Plato as well. If you've ever read any of the Socratic, so Socratic dialogues, there will be these long speeches by Socrates, and then his interlocutor, his, the other person, will just say, like, yes, or I agree. And then it just keeps going. Like there, It's just Socrates acting. He's just doing writing, essentially, not permitting that response because he already has the answers, um, which is, anyways, kind of getting off uh, course here. Anyways, here we go. So now having established that there is the pharmacon, like Socrates is pharmacon, and then there is the pharmacon of the sophists, Derrida goes on to explain or to illustrate what Socrates' pharmacon looks like. Now, we, we probably all know how uh, Socrates died. He was accused by the state, uh, by the city rulers, of poisoning the minds of the youth or corrupting the minds of the youth. 
and he was forced to take Hemlock to die, essentially. And he had the option to leave. But he said, no, I will follow the law. I will take the Hemlock and, and die, and that will be it. So in that act, he demonstrated that he did not have a fear of death. He embraced law and rationality in order to uh, demonstrate his lack of fear of death, how he was above death. So this relates to a broader uh, hatred of death. And there's kind of a long quote here that Derrida gives us, so I'm going to read it twice, but I, it explains it pretty well. So the eidos, truth, law, the episteme, dialectics, philosophy, all these are other names for that pharmacon that must be opposed to the pharmacon of the sophists and to the bewitching fear of death. So we have eidos, truth, law, episteme, rationality, philosophy, all of these ideas, Socratic ideas, are supposed to be opposed to the fear of death that is part of the sophists, part of sophistry. But interestingly, and in that e e Egyptian myth where Tot, the moon god, is associated with death, it seems as though it's Tamus who's the one who's scared of death. And when Socrates uses that myth, it seems as though he's scared of death, like he's scared of writing as being a sign of death. But anyways, uh, that's neither here nor there. Or it is kind of here and there. It's an important point, not one Derrida makes. It's my point. Someone might find a hole with it. I'd be interested if you wanted to leave a comment what you think about that. Anyways, so Socrates had no problem with Hemlock then. He had no problem with ending his own life because that poison was a way into the contemplation of the eidos and the immortality to the soul. So the idea here, and this is why uh, you know, Socrates is described as being the, the father, of course the father, of philosophy because he understood uh, of the immortality of the soul and that death was only the extension of life. Life would only extend through death. But again then, why the fear of death? If death is only an extension to life, as he understood, why then was writing um, described as something uh, to bemoan by virtue of its relationship with death? But it, the mystery persists. So in this uh, moment, writing is associated with sensibility and the body, and is detrimental to the intellect, whereas logos is detrimental to the sensible, to the body, to uh, feeling. But it is good for the intellect. Now, the, the distinction is not quite so neat, remember, because pharmacon can mean either uh, remedy or poison. It can be one or the other. So it is important to keep that in mind. Otherwise, we're going to be, <laughs> we'll just uh, fall back into a kind of Platonism, privileging one or the other, where the pharmacon is a lot more ambiguous. It is as Derrida says, it is the play of difference that conditions all binaries, that is, any other binary that would follow it, uh, good and evil, the binary of soul and body, and etc., where these two things often fold into and resemble one another, very much like writing and speech, where pharmacon is a word that's used to describe both of them and can stand in for both of them, and they are dependent upon one another. The dominant term, in this case speech, never wants writing to go away, because if it did, then speech itself would go away or be revealed as just being another element of writing, being only writing itself, being only exteriority itself, being only textuality itself. And this is made clear a kind of fear of um, losing the other, the other that is subordinate. This was very clear in Greece where there are people who are called uh, pharmakai. I don't know if that's how you actually pronounce it, but pharmakai, uh, who were magician-like figures within the city uh, squares, or sit in, within the cities. Now these figures, uh, Plato doesn't really mention them at all, but they were people who were scapegoated if bad things befell the city. So they would be uh, kind of willingly subordinated. And if, you know, there was ever a drought or anything like that, the city would say, oh, it's because of them, let us now uh, sacrifice them but we have to keep some alive in order to keep uh, a stock of sacrificial people around. And that is because they had to retain something of the negative of what they disdained in order to condition that very insidedness, very, um, the very uh, essence of, of the inside that they could oppose to the outside of these magician-like figures the, who would be treated as scapegoats. And it's like how uh, a vaccine works, you know, how the classic vaccine works. You, you inject 
some of the thing that threatens you into your body so that you develop the tools to uh, challenge it. So you're putting the negative within you in order to fight that negative. And isn't this, and this is why Derrida thinks it's kind of interesting, Plato never mentions these figures, but isn't this kind of what happened to Socrates? Socrates was a kind of magician-like figure, putting people to sleep with his uh, insightful prose. He was one of these figures that was then used as a scapegoat for the corrupted minds of the youth. And like all the others, uh, Pharmakai, who had to be born on the sixth day, I think, of, of the uh, Thargelion, I think, uh, Derrida says that Socrates was also born on the 6th of, of Thargelion, uh, the day when the Athenians purify the city. And he points out this, isn't, doesn't, this doesn't seem like a coincidence, but it does seem like a decent place for an ad break. Catch you in a second, my loves. All right, hope that wasn't too jarring. Uh, let's keep going. Hey, I gotta make money. I don't make any money. I'm poor. But anyways, tangent. The relationship between, the, between death and the pharmacon is interesting because on the one hand, writing is like a, the death of memory, right? But on the other hand, death is a sign of truth, as I've already kind of laid out, where Socrates dies because he knows that it's all going to be good. Uh, and in the Phaedrus, Socrates compares writing with painting, where painting is, uh, it may include like people, you know, you might be able to paint people, but it is not like they aren't alive, they're just images of people. So both writing and painting represent a kind of deathness of people. So Plato looked a little bit more approvingly upon painting than writing, at least in how it, how it is figured here, because it is very clearly a simulacrum. It is very clearly a representation. It's not trying to uh, lead towards truth, whereas writing, you know, can claim to contain truth. And it very much does contain truth. It's just Hard to accept that fact when you're trying to proffer up speech as, as the dominant term. So writing assumes a kind of, as I've already said, a kind of living dead quality. It's kind of like a zombie. It only repeats and appropriates, like Socrates does with that Egyptian myth. But anyways, it bastardizes truth by turning its attainment into an understanding of language. And it commits a kind of parasite. And what I mean by that is that it challenges speech, which is associated with the father, it's a very paternalistic thing, very much like Tamus, the sun god, was very paternalistic to Tote, the moon god, demigod. Now this, it's unclear whether this really matters to Socrates, though, because truth has already been written in the soul of the learner, in his words. But why is this kind of writing okay for Socrates? Like the writing of truth onto the soul is somehow okay. And that kind of writing, in, in him saying that, and how he can't come to this conclusion is a mystery, but that demonstrates that the very origin of speech, that which Socrates does, he speaks, he speaks this truth of the soul, came to him through writing, this having been written upon his soul, that we all have. The truth is all within us in this proper Socratic fashion. We can arrive there through discourse, through contemplation. So it is revealed then that the Phaedrus isn't, um, isn't appreciating speech over writing. It is actually just appreciating one kind of writing over another kind of writing. And this was clear from the very beginning when Socrates was not so quick as Phaedrus was to condemn writing wholeheartedly. Socrates left room that writing can open up certain possibilities. So Plato liked writing if it was properly conducted, if it was, if it was the writing of the, uh, onto the soul, the truth onto the soul, if it was contained, if it was managed, if it was organized. And the same thing with, with play and how um, Plato imagined play and games. So any interactions between others, be they games or, or, or to, uh, uh, to do philosophy, must be conducted in the proper way. So he's not criticizing them wholesale. He says that dialectics, you know, engagements with others can be either good or bad. It's good as long as it is driving towards truth in the way that Plato imagined it. And the big kicker here is that, you know, Plato wrote, right? Plato was no stranger to writing. Uh, he, he used writing as a sign to truth. 
So the sign is dialectics is itself truth. And here we get Derrida saying that non-truth is here the truth. Non-presence is the presence. So this is very much all building from what he developed in Of Grammatology, which I've covered as well. I should have mentioned that earlier. I think in the last episode I did. Anyways, if you want more on that, you can go check out Of Grammatology. But his point here is that this subordinated term, while not trying to privilege that term, is trying to demonstrate that the many different ideas associated with the term as being an addition, being a supplement, being an exteriority, you know, an outside, actually embodies both of the terms, where speech is itself only a kind of writing. So when he says that, as I just mentioned, non-truth is the truth, what he is saying is that, of course, there is no uh, truth, but that truth is always only caught up in the service of maintaining a distinction between non-truth and truth, which is operational for truth to be uh, utilized for certain ends. It was in Plato's interest to maintain a certain idea about acceptable speech or acceptable writing in order to make his writing or his speech the most acceptable. And it is very useful in that way. And that pretty much uh, covers it. That is Plato's Pharmacy. I hope you found it useful. Next time we'll cover the double session and then that will uh, round out this text. If you found what I did helpful, you know, like, share, subscribe, leave five stars if you have the option. If there's anything I excluded or that I got wrong, I would love to hear about it. Uh, I'm super fascinated with this stuff and I I struggle with it. Like this, I, it took me a while to get through this and to really, as far as I, <laughs> as far as I know, really understand it. So yeah, if there's anything I messed up, I'd love to hear about it. And yeah, on that note, take care.